Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for this little slightly late, but uh, mini lecture to contextualize Thomas More's Utopia. Uh, this will be just a short, brief mini video like I did for Plato's Republic, just to give us a sense of the time and the occasion uh, that Thomas More was writing in uh, to help us understand the book Utopia here. So this shouldn't take more than a few minutes here, but I do want to provide some background that might help you understand the reading and guide our discussion on Friday and next week. So Thomas More uh, is an interesting figure. He's on the one hand, a staunch Catholic. On the other hand, he is a patron of Renaissance humanism. He opposed the Reformation um, that as you'll see in Utopia called for freedom of religion in Utopia, or at least described the Utopians as having freedom of religion. Uh, he lived from 1478 until he was executed for treason in 1535. He was a lawyer, a philosopher, a theologian, a logician. Um, he was a politician. He was a one of King Henry VIII's advisors. Well, he, um, and, but he was also a philosopher, wrote philosophical treatises. He was devoutly spiritual. He adopted many ascetic practices, such as wearing a hair shirt underneath his garments to atone for his sins. Um, but while, and while he was kind of conservative in that respect, he also did believe in educating women and personally educated all of his daughters so that they would receive the same classical education in the ancient Greeks and Romans and Latin and Greek and rhetoric and logic uh, that young men were receiving. Um, and he was a, had a successful legal and political career. Um, that he was also like well known for being a member of like the Renaissance humanist revival. Um, he was good friends with Erasmus of Rotterdam. Um, he believed in kind of this recovery of ancient Greek and ancient Roman wisdom um, and this kind of recovery of the classical classical texts uh, as valuable, um, kind of moving us out of the medieval period into closer and closer to the Enlightenment. Um, but he's in many ways well known for his role as his political career. Um, he was named Lord Chancellor by uh, Henry VIII, uh, and during that time he opposed the Reformation on the continent of Europe. He called Luther's 95 Theses a declaration of war. He called Tyndale's translation of the Bible into English a heresy. Um, and this came to a head during uh, Henry VIII's attempt to annul his marriage of, to Catherine of Aragon in order to wed Anne Boleyn in search of a male heir to retain his family bloodline's power on the throne of England. Moore refused to join with many of the clergy and aristocrats who supported Henry's goals and supported his annulment. Uh, Moore himself believed that only the Pope had the authority to make this decision to annul the marriage of King Henry VIII and that the kings were supposed to be subservient to the Pope as the Pope was the representative of God on earth. The Pope held not just spiritual authority for more, but political authority. Um, and then Henry VIII, when he was unable to get an annulment from the Pope, declared himself head of the Church of England. And the bishops of the uh, Convocation of Canterbury, uh, the bishops of the Church of England agreed and called on all clergy to sign an oath of supremacy. More refused and then resigned as Lord Chancellor. Moore also refused to attend the wedding of Henry and Boleyn. And Moore also refused to sign the Oath of Succession, which declared that Boleyn's children to be the heirs to the throne and repudiated the authority of the Pope. Uh, and when he refused to do this, he was indicted for treason. The jury found Moore guilty of treason by challenging the authority of the king over the Church of England. And he was executed on July 6th, 1535, where his last words were reported to have been, I am the king's good servant, but God's first. So despite this inherent conservatism, Utopia is heralded as an important piece of humanism. And it is, as you'll see, it, the text itself explicitly calls for a series of social and political reforms. Um, the book was published originally in Latin in 1516 and then in England, or sorry, in English in 1551 after Moore's death. Um, and so it's kind of, it's being published in the context of books like Machiavelli's The Prince, which was originally distributed in 1530, 1513 and published in 1532. Uh, and in this early 16th century uh, genre of princely literature or mirrors of princes, that would, these were advice books for princes and kings, uh, were a popular genre. Um, so we can think of, on the one hand, Moore's book 
in this genre. But at the same time, there's also a lot of wordplay that kind of complicates our interpretation of Moore's utopia. Uh, we've already talked about the word utopia itself, which means non-place, or if you read the U as an EU, a good place, this kind of bivalence between uh, what utopia even is supposed to mean. Uh, but the character who describes utopia, the, who has returned from his voyages in the Atlantic Ocean to England to describe the wonderful constitution of the utopians, uh, Raphael Hithliday, is another play on words. Uh, Thomas More is kind of showing off his knowledge of Greek. Uh, and if we translate this Hithliday from the uh, Greek, it, it, its name is purveyor of nonsense. Um, so it's hard to tell exactly what we're supposed to interpret from Hithliday's description of this island of utopia. You'll also notice in this book that um, More is both the author of the book and also a character in the dialogue. Um, and how are we supposed to, and how should we interpret these two different mores? Um, because more the author is writing the words, obviously, that Raphael Hithliday is describing as this preferred constitution of the utopians that would solve many of the problems facing Europe. Um, but more the character doesn't seem to necessarily agree. So who should we take more the real life person's actual voice to be? Is more or is Hithliday's Moore's actual opinions, or is the character Thomas More in the narrative, in the dialogue, Thomas More, the real person's actual opinions? And so we kind of have a series of questions that I want you to think about while you're reading in, uh, Moore's Utopia. Is this supposed to be just an advice book for princes? That, that in describing this utopia, um, Moore is giving advice to princes on how they could stop some of the problems facing, that he sees facing uh, kings and or in early modern Europe. Is this a blueprint? Is Thomas More providing an outline of an ideally just society when he describes the constitution of the utopians? Or is this, as many people interpret this book to be, a work of satire? That what More is trying to do is show how ridiculous some of these proposals from uh, the elimination of private property to religious freedom to um, to this kind of communal work sense uh, that we see in, in Utopia, that he's actually trying to uh, make this a satire and that we shouldn't take these ideas seriously, but we should take these as more criticizing these proposals and showing the ridiculousness of the kind of Renaissance humanism taken to its extreme. Um, the, the political theorist and history, intellectual historian Quentin Skinner calls this book the humanistic critique of humanism. So that's all I have for today, just to give you a little bit of background and some things to help you think, things to think about while reading uh, Utopia. We'll re we'll, I'll see you in class, next class, and we will hopefully dig into some of these interpretive and theoretical issues in more detail. Uh, I hope you enjoy the reading and I'll see you next class.